You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Pet Life Radio. Just go to it and see if it's what. Okay. And welcome, welcome. You're here live with Dr. Jeff Weber, your host for the next 30 minutes here on Pet Life Radio's Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff. We're here for you. We're here for your pets. Answer any questions, uh, whatever you want to talk about. We're here to do just that. You can get us a hold of us a couple of easy ways. Number one, the good old fashioned way. Is this good for a lot of people? The toll free phone number 877 385 8882. Once again, 877 385 8882. You can also drop me an email to Dr. Jeff, Dr. Jeff at PetLifeRadio.com. It'll be forwarded to me live. And lastly, the best way is joining us here in Google Hangouts. If you go on to PetLifeRadio.com, click on Shows, scroll down to Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff. And as you scroll down, you're going to see a big box, and there's going to be a Google Hangouts. Click on it, and you can join us live right here on Google Hangouts with your, you, your pet, whatever you want to do. And we can talk about whatever we want to talk about. And as you know, in my show, I like to go over some of the uh, AHA American Animal Hospital uh, Association news stat and the American Veterinary Medical Association uh, smart brief. But today we're going to change our order because we have a guest um, who reached out to us. A great question, uh, especially this time of year, because we start seeing these little vermins, these little mosquitoes during the spring uh, in some parts of the country the year round, uh, usually in the southern states, uh, in the Gulf Coast, uh, they're, they're there all the time. But um, even up in northern parts of the United States, where they don't have um, mosquitoes during the winter, will get them pretty badly during the humid summers. Uh, so something that we really should talk about. Anyway, it's a great question. So um, I'd like to welcome Gina here. Gina, who is actually from Florida, so she has to deal with this year round, um, adopted a, a, a about a one-year-old uh, Aussie Catahoula. If you don't know what a Catahoula is, you got to just look them up. They are so cool looking. Uh, cross and obviously also herding dogs. Um, but what's interesting is with the that combination, we have one smart dog, uh, probably smarter than I am. So uh, <laughs> it's just you know when you think of the the Aussies and the Catahoulas and all these herding dogs, the Border Collies, um, they're really really smart. And uh, Gina is joining us from Hallandale Beach, Florida, South Florida, very close to Miami, kind of in between Miami and Fort Lauderdale. And Gina has a question and a problem with heartworm. Gina, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. So, so tell us, you did a great thing, and you adopted this really, I'm sure, cool-looking dog. If you yeah, yeah. on your lap, I don't know if that'd be possible. We'd love to see him. But um, so, tell us, uh, he was you adopted him. Great, great thing to do. And he came with a, an extra gift, a special gift of heartworm disease. So, um, was he? Tell, tell us first of all, did you notice any clinical signs? It was just picked up on a routine exam. Oh no, uh, we adopted her from the Humane Society and they informed us of it, And but she does not have any symptoms. Okay, no symptoms yet. So they, you knew that she was a heartworm positive dog beforehand. Um, right. Did they, um, uh, um, x-rays have been taken and all that? So the, any changes in her chest yet? Um, I'm not sure if they did do x-rays. Mm -hmm. They're going to be treating her. Oh, they are, They're, okay. Yes. Right. Okay, so at least that's a good thing because it could be a pretty expensive treatment. Yes, and, I heard that. And, and the concern is about treatment and her. You have you? to keep her quiet. Exactly. So it's one of those things where as we are killing the, well, first of all, we should talk about heartworm disease itself. Heartworm disease is a literally just that, mosquito-driven, the larval stage of the heartworm, microfilaria, um, is, is injected into dogs from mosquito bites. So mosquitoes pick up these babies from one dog that they bite, and then they are so kind, they really want to share. So what do they do? They inject it into the next unsuspecting victim. So, so we end up with these you know, uh, larval stages, these little baby heartworms that grow to be baby heartworms. And um, it is really a problem because they grow to adult worms. And what happens is the adult worms want to lodge in the um, heart, and the major vessels going out of the heart into the lungs, and it really creates a problem. But not just our heartworms a problem, and potentially deadly. Interestingly, in my office, I have a heart, literally in formalin, uh, from a dog that died of heartworm disease. And if you wanna gross people out, 
If you want to scare them into making sure they test their dogs for heartworm and treat them if needed, all I need to do is show them this picture. And not, not this picture, this heart. It's a real heart. And it's in a glass jar. And all you see, you know, think of, think of taking a heart and stuffing it with angel hair pasta. But in every vein, vessel, the, the, the ventricles, atria, they're all over the heart. And so there's, what happens is it really destroys. There's no place for the blood to go. They, they, they can't pump blood, and it becomes a major problem. But having said that, another problem is when you are treating heartworm disease, and the first thing we want to do is kill off the microfilaria. We're going to talk about treatment in a second. We want to cover with the antibiotics, usually doxycycline, um, maybe even some steroids, and then the actual adulticide. The adulticide, we call it imidacide. And what happens is that as these adult worms are starting to die, if you have an active dog that's running around and now all these adult worms will clog up and lodge and block a major vessel. So what we tell people that it's one of those diseases where the treatment not is, but could potentially can be just as bad as the disease itself. And so Gina, when she reached out to us, it was that, is there, what do you do? You have a, a year old dog mm -hmm. who is a herding dog. What do year old herding dogs like to do, Gina? Play and herd. They like to run around, you betcha. Right. You cannot get them to sit still for a second. And this poor dog, Blueberry, right? Is that her name? Right, yep, we uh, call her Blue. Blue, uh, mm -hmm. it's great, well, it's perfect for, for these breeds, by the way. Um, <laughs> So she now has to go through this treatment and for several months, and that's the problem, because when I, we're going to talk about the treatment itself. So now, did you get her online or did you go into a shelter and find her or how, how did the, this marriage take place? Well, my, uh, my daughters both volunteer at the Humane Society frequently, and so I'm there a lot and I walk the kennels all the time. And we were not in the uh, market for a dog, but she just, you know, she was the one. And that was it. We now, went the next day and brought her home. Now, is she your only dog? No, we have a 16-year-old Sheltie. Oh, wow. That's, that's really good. That's and she good. was also a heartworm, po she was heartworm positive when we got her, too. She really? was from a shelter in Ohio. Yeah. What I was, telling, I was uh, telling Gina before the show, in, in, in Los Angeles, we don't really have a huge heartworm problem. Uh, there is a mosquito that, we've, that has been discovered here. Um, and we anticipate that we will start having some heartworm disease in the next several years, but it's minimal. In fact, I actually had one of my first cases, I think I talked about this last week, the week before, of my of heartworm positive dog in a dog that never left Los Angeles. So that is very rare. Mm -hmm. But during Katrina, there were hundreds of dogs that were shipped out to shelters all across the country. And everyone, I'd say 95% of the dogs that we had here in LA were heartworm positive. So I was treating a lot of heartworm dogs. So um, anyway, uh, it's you know it's it's something that is very treatable. Uh, you would never not want to take the perfect dog because of heartworm, um, but obviously, so it, so you know just so you, you get a feel for what's going on with this disease, um, treatment is extensive, and just I'm sure if you are pet lovers and I know you're listening to the show, so you are, you've already learned I'm sure over the years that when something in the veterinary world is extensive, it's also expensive. So <laughs> you have to know that uh, uh, treatment, treatment for heartworm is expensive. Um, and partly because of the hoops that we have to go through to make sure and to assure that these dogs are gonna be safe during treatment. So the first thing we wanna do is usually for probably two months is start them on a preventive. Um, we wanna kill off the microfilaria and before we start killing off the adults um, that are going to leave more microfilaria behind, we want to kill off all the other microfilaria because the adulticides don't usually kill the microfilaria. So we want to get just the, the, the what we call the baby heartworms um, under control. Um, during this time, we'll probably have them on, as I said, either minocycline or doxycycline, which is an antibiotic. Um, mm -hmm. And we're also going to possibly, some people like to put them on some cortic corticosteroids. Why? Because sometimes as these microflaria and the adult hormones die, there's going to be a almost like an allergic reaction. There's going to be inflammation. So we want to minimize that by putting them on the uh, corticosteroids. Then after treatment, now mind you, during this time, they have to be pretty quiet because now we know they're heartworm positive. 
and we want them to be somewhat serious. Now we're looking at roughly eight weeks. Now we start the adulticide, and that is imidacide, uh, diraban. There are a couple of glands out there to caparsalate, and what we do is that's given, and they're usually kept in the hospital for at least a day or two. Um, it, it's, it's injected, and um, a deep, deep, deep intramuscular injection, and then we want, as I say, keep them very quiet. They go home, uh, continue on medication. Then they come back one month later for two more injections, which you can either do one more, but I, we, we do two more, 24 hours apart, consecutive. And during that time, um, again, they have to be very quiet. And then you have to wait another, say, 30 to 45 days. So we're looking at several periods of 30 to 45 days of little to no exercise. This poor blue. <laughs> All she wants to do is run out and play, and yeah. you're going to have to keep her somewhat confined. And uh, it is important. The only thing I can promise you, well, first of all, you want to make sure, just FYI, because she is obviously very active and she wants to be very active, um, we have to make sure that she d doesn't stay that way, um, but she might uh, not have the same calorie burning potential that she would normally have. Mm. Therefore, it's important to just keep that in mind because we don't want her to get heavy. Um, yeah. But as far as the, the treatment itself, once she starts moving around, she's only a year of age, correct? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, trust me, the, she is not going to become a couch potato after she's <laughs> trying to be quiet. Because it I'm is. I'm worried about her. I was more worried about her socialization. Yeah. Well, you can. Uh, here's the thing: if if w w with control, I mean, a dog's on a leash. Plus, you have another dog. Now, I'd imagine a 16-year-old Sheltie is not very active. And they, they do not get along. Oh, they don't get along. Shelty, I'm sure, is the problem. Because yes. now you have this puppy, this blue, who yeah. is a bundle of energy. And one, <laughs> yeah. of course, he's a first dog and all he wants to do is play. And the Shelty says, you know, some, Arr, no, yes, not, exactly. ever, not ever. So, uh, yeah, we have that too. We just introduced a new, a new dog, a little puppy rescue into the house. And one of my dogs is a 14 year old, la full size Labradoodle. Mm -hmm. And he does not have the patience for no. a new, Seven month old pup who tries to play with all over the place. Now, my seven year old Labrador and my French Bulldog, oh my God, they're having a blast. But then he runs over and tries to play with, with Pierce, my, and Pierce is not, just not having it. No. So, you know, I get it. So, if you have, I would say, friends that have dogs mm -hmm. and preferably dogs that are not as active and animated as Blue, mm -hmm. uh, maybe older, maybe somewhat more sedate, maybe a little smaller, and just, you know, just for the socialization aspect. It's not like, Blue needs to be in a locked up in a cage, but no running can go on a leash walk mm -hmm. under control, and and that kind of thing you know is fine. Plus, another thing, just I'm, I'm sure you've been told that um, they don't they don't really once they're socialized they don't become unsocialized. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that key socialization as you're training and raising these dogs, believe it or not, between eight and eighteen weeks of age, that's when the imprint is pretty much settled. So if, if, if he's, she is already socialized, and typically these are breeds that are not aggressive breeds. They're, if anything, they want to play, they want to herd. Um, then um, she's not going to become, she'll, she'll definitely pick up where she left off. That's no. not a problem. Um, but she comes after, you know, other dogs with both big paws, you know, in front of her, just wanting to. But just wants to play, right. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's funny, just the other day in my office, uh, a guy comes in with not one, not two, but three corgis. Now, mm -hmm. corgis are also little herding dogs, but cor corgis are the quintessential healer other than healers. And when I, I had corgis before, and I had them with two Labradors, and all this little corgi wanted to do was nip at their heels and herd them. If, 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 if she wanted to go, in, he wanted to go inside, he would go grab them and have them try to herd them inside as well. <laughs> uh, it got to the point where it wasn't always very pretty because all they wanted to do is, would you leave me the heck alone already? <laughs> and uh, oh God, he just kept going after them. But so um, you always, always have them on a leash or a harness when you're going to go out. Yep, and she is. make sure you're controlled. And always, if you see other dogs coming and you already know how she is, with her, this energy, this bounding, literally energy, mm -hmm. what you can also do is ask her to sit and stay mm -hmm. and, and sort of keep her under control. Um, I don't know if, if you use a halter, you've ever seen them. I do. Mm -hmm. leader, but um, also that what, what I found, the benefit of one of the benefits is as they're pulling and their head is being pulled up to you, 
it, it reestablishes that eye contact. And mm -hmm. all, trust, trust me, read our eyes. So yeah. anyway, um, uh, going on our break here, I do want to uh, thank you for calling in. Um, it, it's, a, uh, it's a fantastic question because, as I said, springtime is here. We are going to see a lot more heartworm. And I would uh, recommend for all of our listeners, if you haven't had your dog heartworm tested and at least put on a heartworm preventative, now is the time to do it. You want to start preventative now. Um, we don't. We want to uh, take care of all these microfilaria before they come adult heartworms. Um, and if they're and uh, so negative, uh, as soon as you have a negative test, you want to go ahead and go um, and start treatment. And there, it's the treatments are inexpensive. They are very safe. They're monthly chewables, or uh, they're so easy. So make sure you get your dog started on those right away. So Gina. Thank yeah. you so much for calling and joining us. Is is Blue right there or no? Oh, can you bring Blue over? Let's just uh, take a look at this bag. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure she'll be happy to jump up on the counter and see oh, you. I'm sure she will. <laughs> so, um, yeah, they're, uh, they're really good. Catahoula leopards, you know, it's funny. They're not uh, not very popular. And, uh, they're so, so beautiful. Don't... Well, Oh, they're great dogs. Hey. I know. Come here. She's not usually allowed in the kitchen. Yeah, she's not usually allowed in the kitchen. So she's oh. Come here, baby. <laughs> Oh, my dogs. Your little face up there. My dogs are in the. Oh look! Oh, they're coming. Where are we? Hey! Oh my God! Blue, blue blueberry, blueberry. Oh, great! Very, very cute. <laughs> Adorable. Absolutely. Yeah, you can see such a love. I'm sure she's thrilled to be in her new home. Oh. And, uh, I'm sure you're thrilled to have her. Yes, great. we are. All right. Thanks for joining us here on Pet Life Radio. Don't go away. We'll be right thanks back. So after short messages. <laughs> No, oh, good girl. Right after these messages. Come here, baby. <laughs> She's like, I'm in the kitchen. Oh, I'm in the kitchen. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Don't let that happen to your precious cat. Elevate your cat's eating experience with the cat tree tray. The cat tree tray keeps your cat's food off the floor and conveniently located on the cat tree. It's the perfect way to eat. It's a beautiful wrought iron tray that easily attaches to your cat tree and keeps dogs and other critters out of your cat's dish. A must for multi-pet households. There's a six inch tray for large bowls and a four inch tray for smaller bowls. Purchase your cat tree tray today. Go right now to cattreetray.com. That's cattreetray.com. C-A-T-T-R-E-E-T-R-A-Y.com. It's designerpetsweaters.com, hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Your pets will stay warm for the winter and be runway ready. Large or small, we fit them all. DesignerPetSweaters.com Does your dog itch, scratch, stink, or shed like crazy? Come to Dynavite for help. Order a 90-day supply of Dynavite. Dynavite for life. Pick up two tubes of Doggo Suds. Get the third tube free. Peppermint, tea tree, lavender, Doggo Sud shampoo. Made with all natural coconut, jojoba, aloe. Great for healthy skin and soft, shiny coats. But no itchy, harsh chemicals. Lather up, rinse away. Try Doggo Suds. Buy two, get one free. At Dynavite.com. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E.com. Begging to hear more of your favorite show? Full episodes of all our shows are available on demand. Go to PetLifeRadio.com to fetch our entire lineup of possum pet podcasts. Also, dig us up in iHeartRadio and iTunes. Let's talk pets. Live and on demand only from Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Okay. And welcome back. You're here once again live with Dr. Jeff. If anyone, any of our listeners wants to join us here live on Google Hangouts on Pet Life Radio's Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff, you can do what Gina just did. 
um, just uh, either write us in and we will give you instructions how to join us. We'd love to hear from you. We can talk about any subject that you want. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, we just talked about heartworm disease in springtime and I wanted to go through some of the AVMA Smart Brief stuff. And sure enough, the, you know, one of the first stories was weather's improving, chip, clip and brush and get our pets ready for spring. Uh, we want to brush off the winter coats um, so they start uh, breathing a little bit better. You check for skin lesions because now you're going to do brush and um, clean them up a little bit. You want to clean your yards to prevent uh, possibilities of parasitic infections. Trim nails. Now make sure you start, you're going to be starting to exercise more because the weather is getting better. Make sure to start slowly and gradually work up. Very important and exercise early morning, late evening. You do not want to exercise in the middle of the hot day. We worry about heat stroke. Um, uh, also the, the pads can burn very easily. Uh, if your dogs, like mine, love to swim, um, make sure that they know how to get out of the pool in case they fall out. Um, I mean, fall in the pool. You know, interesting, my, um, two of my dogs, Frenchies, as you know, and um, uh, they have both fallen in the water more than once. And the first thing we did is teach them where the stairs were. And though they're in panic mode, though they look like, um, uh, like oh, my God, it's, it's the, the look on their face, it's... Uh, you can see the, the fear, the anxiety, but they make beelines right for those stairs and they get out. So that's very important. Um, uh, interesting, a man feeding feral cats. He was doing the right thing. He thought he was helping. Well, he was bitten by one of those feral cats. And guess what? Cat had rabies. So um, be very, very careful. If you want to be a good Samaritan, you want to help stray animals, you're going to feed them. Be careful. Do not handle them. Uh, and that even goes for cute little cats and, and kittens, puppies, because you never know. Um, and uh, you, uh, depending on what stage of the disease, you, you, won't, you may not see anything abnormal about the animals. So be very careful. I'm not saying don't, but call animal control, see what you can do the right way, but don't, uh, don't start petting and handling um, some of these stray animals, especially if they are, are like hissing at you. You just gotta be careful. I mean, like I, look, I know the feeling. One of my best cats ever who lives here now, he was an outdoor cat, found him on the street, no ID, kept coming over to us. Um, we finally brought him indoors, had him tested for everything, vaccinated him. He was leukemia negative, all the good things. And uh, at first he was trying to escape every minute he could. Now the doors in the house can be wide open and he'll go to the doorway and he'll look outside and look to the left, look to the right and get nah, back inside. So uh, anyway, it's good to, to give him a, a good home. Speaking of bites, uh, this week is National Dog Bite Prevention Week. So as I mentioned, Exercise caution with dogs that you don't know. Um, go up to them, approach slowly, get kind of get, get low. Don't stick your face in theirs. Just because your dogs lick, and my dogs lick me in the face all the time. My patients lick me in the face all the time. But strange dogs, you do not know. You want to just go easy. Um, and if you have children, teach them how, again, to approach a dog, a strange dog. Hands down, palms down. Um, go very slow. No sudden movements. And interestingly, the, the, the kids that have the most issues with strange stray dogs are kids that grow up with dogs. Why? Because they have no fear. They've already learned that you can do anything to my dog. I can grab them, I can hug them, I can roll on top of them. And they think, oh my God, another dog, I can do that as well. Well, not so fast. So um, just know it's great. Obviously your kids are not afraid of dogs if you have dogs in the household, but it's very important to teach them that not every dog is like our dog and you have to approach slowly. Um, Again, another seasonal Easter is literally around the corner. And um, so think about as an alternative, chocolate bunnies or stuffed toy bunnies instead of the real thing. Actually, bunny rabbits are the third most, um, I, I guess, uh, surrendered pets to shelters across the country. Of course, dogs, cats, dogs, and now bunnies. So um, it's, they're not, they're adorable. Trust me, they're adorable. But they do need veterinary care. They, they eat a lot. They have special diets um, and special food. They eat constantly. Um, they need exercise. Uh, it's not just, oh, my God, I have this cute thing. Um, not like good old, you know, my little Lou hamster here who gets plenty of exercise, of course, because he is so social. But, you know, those little teeny pocket pets, yeah, they can stay in their cages. You can take them out and, and pet them a little bit, play with them. But bunnies need a lot more than that. So um, probably not the best gift especially when you know that uh, probably two thirds of them or more are gonna end up somewhere in a bunny rescue or a shelter. So kind of uh, be careful with those. Um, this also, um, and I, 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 I can't say I love to hear the stories, 
but I love to hear what many municipalities are doing when it comes to these types of stories. A Michigan woman now facing felony charges for torturing or killing an animal, which is great for Michigan. Thank you, thank you, Michigan. What she did was really stupid. Um, she left three dogs, her three dogs, in a parked car for several hours outside of a casino so she could go and play. She comes out, didn't crack the windows. Even if she did, obviously it wasn't enough. And as I said, it's not, you can't always get the uh, enough circulation. Three dogs in a car. Um, just to tell you how, how it works as a, as, a, as a hot box, as a sweat box. If you remember, a dog's temperature is about 101, 102 degrees normal. When a dog pants, and if you stick your face in front of a panting dog, what's coming out of them is hot, okay? Much warmer than we are. So now you put three dogs in a car, fairly closed, and even if the windows are cracked a little bit, and what happens when dogs are in a car, they're alone, they get excited. They start moving around. They're jumping up. They're looking through the windows. They're getting more agitated. They're starting to pant even more. So that hot air is taking that car that was maybe 70 something degrees temp, maybe in Michigan even cooler, but without the air circulation, now they're creating an environment where the ambient temperature is going up to 80, to 90, to 100. And before you know it, uh, these dogs go into heat stroke, uh, dehydration. Uh, anyway, sadly, two of the three dogs passed away. Uh, one was fortunately captured, helped in time, rescued in time, had to needed treatment, needed fluids, needed treatment for heat stroke. His temperature was well over 105 degrees. Um, that is, this is really crazy, people. And how many times have you heard, especially now that we're approaching warmer weather or across the whole country, do not leave your dogs in a parked car, not even in the shade, and not even if you crack the windows. You're just kidding yourself. It's not like you're they're in view, you're putting them in the car because you're running literally across the street to put your letter in a mailbox, and then you're coming back out. Yeah, guys, that's fine. But don't park and go into a store, into a business, thinking the dog's going to be fine. Um, so anyway, it's, uh, I'm sure you've heard the story about that, that um, uh, MMA fighter who left his dog tied to a car in a, in a parking structure in, a, in a, uh, an airport in Texas. Um, and uh, for, he, was, he, he, he was gone. Uh, fortunately, two days later, some guy who parked in the same lot saw the dog tied to the car. He didn't know. He thought maybe the guy was just picking somebody up and just left the dog there, which would have been fine. His dog was not you know, in, a, in the car. It was just tied to the, the bumper. Um, uh, but when he comes back two days later and the dog is still there, ah, uh, that set the, 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 alarm. So sure enough, um, it would belong to some fighter, Jesse, I don't know his name. Anyway, that's crazy. The guy claims that he, he tried to, to find a home. He could have taken him to his, it was his mother's dog, take it to the vet and say, you know, I got to board the dog indefinitely. I'm trying to find a home for it. Whatever. There were certainly other things he could have done other than just leave a dog um, to a, next to a parked car for at least four days. Unfortunately, um, they, they, it was it turned out to be only two because of the Good Samaritan. Um, in Vegas, if you are in Las Vegas, be careful. There's someone out there, whether you call it for fun or or just torture, is throwing strychnine laced meats into backyards that have dogs. Um, already, um, at least one dog died. Uh, strychnine, and, and it works fast. It can cause respiratory failure, brain damage. Um, it's 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 a pretty bad poison. I'm sure you've heard it. So like, you know, arsenic, strychnine, these things that people use to poison people. Um, it's very, very harmful, clearly, to dogs as well. Um, and lastly, uh, we've talked about CBD before. Um, as a California veterinarian, I, I am not allowed to throw my two cents in. Um, but I will tell you that that there are a lot uh, there's a lot of controversy out there still. Number one is because there's no way that we know yet really how to dose it. There are too many products out there with not only, they could tell you, yes, mine have three milligrams of, of pure CBD. That's great. But where's that CBD coming from? How is it being processed? And it's not just the CBD oil, but what goes into making the CBD oil. And what they're finding is through testing, just as an example, because CBD comes from help from hemp, excuse me, or from um, from marijuana. And apparently it's the same 
CBD from a chemical standpoint, but those these are both grown plants. So what are they finding? They're finding pesticide residues in the CBD and also heavy metals from the soil that these plants are grown in. So there, there's so much more that needs to be done, needs to be standardized, doses need to be standardized, the amounts of chemicals need to be standardized. Um, and when we get to, to um, marijuana products with THC, and not just the CBD, but it's going to present more problems because there's so many different types of THC out there, different types of marijuana with different strengths. Um, uh, in order for this to be accepted, at least in the veterinary community, I mean, you can walk into a store, buy what you want in many states now. Uh, federally now, it's, 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 it's accepted for recreational use, marijuana, but we can't, we don't know enough about dogs and to start saying, yes, go ahead and use it. I've heard a lot of empirical data. Uh, you can go online. I just came back from the, the big uh, pet trade show in Orlando called Global Pet Expo, GPE. And uh, oh God, that is one of the newest things out there. There must have been two dozen booths that were promoting their CBD products, the CBD oil, CBD treat, CBD this, CBD that. And, um, you know, they all are so totally pure and tested and safety, et cetera, et cetera. Meanwhile, there's still a lot we just don't know. So do your reading, do your homework, go online, check with your veterinarian. Um, but uh, as I said, I'm not, we're not ready yet to say, oh, yes, you know, go ahead and, and, and use it because it's fantastic. Um, the empirical data, as I said, is rather impressive, no doubt. Um, I went into, I was in a uh, store in Colorado last year and had a big chart of all the benefits of CBD, THC, CBN, all the can cannabinoids and um, with or without THC, and admittedly, rather impressive, but we still don't know enough uh, yet how it is going to affect our pets. So be careful out there. Anyway, thanks for joining me here on Pet Life Radio. I will not be here um, next Sunday. For um, all of you, I wish a uh, happy Easter, happy Passover, whatever the case may be, coming up. And we will be here uh, the following week and um, if you have any questions, by the way, please, Dr. Jeff, Dr. Jeff at PetLifeRadio.com. Um, and uh, you can contact me. That's how Gina contacted me. She reached out to the show, got the email. And next thing you know, she's on our show as a guest with her amazing, beautiful dog, Blue. So we'd like to see you here as well anytime you want. If you have other topics questions that you want answered. If your pet's going through something that you don't quite understand, or if your veterinarian is prescribing some sort of treatment plan that you just think may be excessive, or maybe you just don't know and you want to learn more, that's why I'm here. I'm here for you. I'm here for your pets. So reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Have a great week, two weeks, everybody, and we'll see you here in two. Thanks. <music>